Hello everyone, my name is Rosin, and welcome back to Let's Play Kyuyaku Megami Tensei 2. Last episode, we took advantage of a secret that can be found in Bale's Castle at the Codebreaker game, where if you guess all three of the numbers right on the very first guess, you can gain access to three very powerful demonic party members. There's a whole litany of other things you need to do, but if you want to hear me rant about that, go back to last episode, because I'm not going through that process again. But anyways, that's going to be a boon that will help us out for the entire rest of our playthrough, which is very nice. We also then went to Ground Zero, the explosive epicenter that was one of many explosive uh, nuclear blasts that obviously caused the world to be in the post-apocalyptic hellscape state that it's in uh, back in the human world. And at Ground Zero, we were able to use the Seven Pillars of Solomon that we had been hunting for all throughout the game up until this point to summon a portal to the demon world. We met Masakato as well, the guardian of Tokyo, uh, who was a floating head, and he was just kind of like, hey, I'll take you to the demon world, which was very nice of him. We were then able to go from the central island shrine that we're teleported to to this part of the demon world called the Valley of Despair, uh, where there's a gloomy little village called the Gloomy Village, appropriately enough, and there's a Huge cave system full of tunnels, and I hope you're not sick of them yet, because, oh boy, we're going to be seeing a lot of these green walls and floors. Um, earlier, if you were paying attention, you saw me beat up a Mizuki, and I got a Megaton Axe from it. I just want to remind you, I, I feel like I probably explained this early on in the Let's Play. I, I feel like I would have, but in case I didn't, um, or if even if I did, you know, sometimes it's nice to just give a reminder for these sorts of things. And hey, we're also recruiting a troll along the way, apparently. Um, I feel like I had plans for that. Uh, we'll see later on the Let's Play. I think I wanted to use that as fusion fodder for something. But um, yeah, just as a reminder, I guess. Melee weapons are mostly going to be obtained in this game via random drops. Uh, you're not really going to be buying them for shops or anything like that, typically. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to be buying your guns and armor from shops, and then you're going to be picking up melee weaponry out in the world uh, just by beating enemies. If you really care to, you can kind of look up... Uh, like the Megami Tensei Wiki, I think, lists it all out, like what types of weapons you can get and what enemies drop them. I don't really think that's necessary. Honestly, I played through this game twice now, and I never really had a problem with feeling like I wasn't getting any new weapons. Uh, I feel like you get them at a pretty consistent, maybe not consistent pace, but you get them frequently enough that it, it never really felt like I was too weak or it was a problem or anything like that. I, I never really was uh, too concerned about it, so you probably don't need to worry about it either. Um, I think sometimes you can get weapons from treasure chests like this, but most of the time, I, I, most of the time I feel like you're getting consumables or stat upgrade incenses like this. Um, or, you know, you, you can get equipment from, uh, treasure chests too, definitely. Uh, I think every now and again you might be able to find a weapon in one of those, but I, I could be mistaken. If, if you can, they're so rare that you, you probably shouldn't count on them. You're gonna be getting most of, most of them through, uh, drops along the way. So... I know last episode I kind of discussed my uh, the fact that I didn't really care for the demon world and exploring it as much as I did uh, the Tokyo part of the game, and I thought, yeah, you know, maybe I shouldn't exactly get into that right now because, eh, I don't know, maybe I should just let everyone kind of see for themselves and make up their own mind, but th as I kind of just looked through this footage before I got ready to talk about it, I'm like, you know, I feel like you can even kind of already see what I'm talking about just in this episode itself. Um, specifically, even at the end of last episode, you can kind of see that instead of this being a open world that we're exploring and kind of having a treasure hunt through, uh, the demon world is not really so much a world map. You, you know, it is it is a second world map, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's much more broken up into segmented areas that uh, you're going to need to uh, progress through one to get to the other. Uh, and, you know, there there is some non-linearity stuff going on here and, and some back and forth, uh, kind of more explorative, optional stuff that you can do, surely, but it just doesn't feel as open-ended or as encouraging for uh, discovery as Tokyo does, and I feel like the game kind of... I don't want to say it loses me here because of that, but it definitely made me a little less invested. I felt on both my playthroughs, I was just kind of like, okay... This is, you know, I, the change of scenery is pretty cool, but also, too, like, the game had done such a great job up until this point of winning me over on Tokyo, 
Um, and I also just, I don't find the community is located throughout um, the demon world even as interesting. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't even think the... I don't think the communities are even that fascinating or super detailed back at Tokyo either in this game. I feel like SMT1 actually did a lot better job of making me kind of get a better vibe for individual places. But, you know, there there is at least a little bit more character and the uh, there was a little bit more to each town and they were fleshed out a bit more. You know, obviously, like, Ueno had all of the weird uh, guy and cult stuff going on. You had a bunch of other, or not Gaians, the uh, Davins is what they're called in this game. Whoops, gotta correct myself. Use the proper terminology. Um, you know, just uh, the whole rumors we had, I can't even remember what town it was early on in the game, but you know, you, we went into that one town where we had rumors about uh, the witch at Tokyo Tower. There's the various towns that had the Colosseums or various things like that, that each kind of added personality to the different areas that we went through and a lot of the uh demon world towns just feel a little bit more formulaic and just tinier by comparison which you'll definitely be able to see as we get to more of them where i think we're gonna even get to the second demon town uh a little bit later on in this very episode and you can kind of see what i'm talking about but yeah um i don't know i feel like there's either two different ways they could have gone about it uh, on one hand I feel like maybe the easier thing they could have done is um, make the demon world like the the true like final stretch of the game. Like give me a couple more dungeons at this point. You don't need to flesh it out and try to make it a whole separate world. The game would be a lot shorter as a result. Uh, but you know I think that's kind of fine. Uh, I don't think this game is too long by any means or anything. Um, even if I do think some of the you know this uh, demon world section kind of drags out a little bit. Um, I don't think the game's too long. But I also wouldn't mind if it ended a little bit sooner than it did, if that makes sense. And here we go, here's the second town. As you can see, shops look pretty similar to how they did <laughs> back in the human world. Uh, some things never change, I suppose, in Earth or in Hell. And then also, and god, yeah, look at, look at these armor prices. I, I've complained about them before, but they're just going to get worse and worse as we uh, go further towards the end game here. But as I was saying about the length of the game, and god, yeah, just look at how tiny this town is. Um, if the game was a little bit shorter, and then you got to the demon world and had a couple more dungeons, and you're like, hey, just uh, go through these, and then you'll get to the climax, and it'll be a fun time, that would have been cool. Um, and also, that hint that that NPC gave was fairly important, so rewind that and pay attention to it if you uh, did not. This is also very important. Everyone's talking about this Flood Tide Orb. It's going to be very important for the next area. Not necessarily this one, but the next one. And, of course, there's another Cathedral of Shadows over here, so let's just take a look at the various options we have available for us, since we have a pretty full-looking party, almost. I think we have one free slot there you can see at the bottom. But, uh, as I was saying, I keep interrupting myself again. The other option I think that they could have done for the second half of this game is actually flesh out this world and make it more interconnected. Um, they go for a format here where you go to a different section of the demon world, like right here we're in the Valley of Despair, we're going to beat a boss and then we're going to go to the next section of the demon world and then we're going to rinse and repeat that until we're done with the game. Um, and I think that was kind of a mistake to do it that way. Um, even if, like, on paper you look at the progression between the story events that happen in Tokyo and the story events that happen in the demon world, um, even just by setting it up that way, you're, you're kind of robbing even the illusion of freedom uh, in this part of the game, and it just makes, makes me less invested overall in this part of the world. And I, w I wish it could have been maybe a little bit more fleshed out in that way, made it more interconnected, and even just uh, give me a little bit more to latch onto in terms of each of the individual communities. You know, I'm in an otherworldly place. Make me believe, make me feel like it's otherworldly and like I'm, I'm a fish out of water and I don't quite belong. Uh, I feel like they don't go the extra mile and really do that enough in, uh, in enough places here in this part of the game. And I, I wish things were just a little bit more freaky. Um, and just kind of really get that sense that we've kind of gone into the unknown uh, and we're just really in it now. Um, 
kind of a missed opportunity there. But we did catch Morgan here, who is going to be a very, very good party member for this point in the game, even with all of the big, powerful demons that we just recruited. I I'm going to be very sparing with how I use those, actually, in uh, in many cases, just because, like I have said before, they really drag through your... or not drag through, but really burn through your magnetite. You can even see, traveling around right now, I'm losing 20 magnetite every single step. That's... oof. Yeah, just having Kali <laughs> summoned. Um, and each time you want to summon another one of those uh, demons, you also need to keep in mind you have to spend a little bit of Maka as well, and uh, they're not cheap, so... Gonna need to wait a little bit before we can go all out with having all three of them summoned, but even just having one summoned and uh, just a party full of other demons, or even just having one summoned and not that many other demons summoned, uh, is gonna be a great way to uh, help us get through this part of the game quite easily. Like I said too, this area is pretty tricky. I think it's a, a pretty good ramp up in difficulty in many ways. Uh, Enemies here like to hit kind of hard. Um, we're going to get to a kind of tricky mini-boss fight here, too, actually, which I don't know how close we are to uh, getting there, but this uh, this part of the game don't fuck around, that's for sure. You can really beeline it through these caves if you really wanted to, but there are a lot of different, as you saw, treasure chests that contain various incenses and stuff like that, which, in my opinion, it's a good idea to just go through and try to get those. Not only because it's just kind of nice to have those stat increases right now, but uh, just by going through the caves, you'll be forcing, your, you know, forcing yourself to fight various random encounters and level up your characters more and more, and uh, maybe along the way pick up a few more demons. Um, that's if you're playing normally and you didn't do the stupid shit like I did with, uh, doing all the nonsense at, with, uh, Codebreaker and all that. Like, the fact that I have Kali summoned right now means I don't really gotta worry too much about random encounters doing too much harm to me. Also keep in mind that around this point in the game, Asuka is starting to learn some more powerful group attack magic spells. You know, like Mazionga or Maziolone or whatever... Whatever they call it in this game, I <laughs> the uh, the uh, Mega Ten One and Two spell names always trip me up because they're different than the what was later used for the mainline entries. Oh yeah, and that troll dropped a jewel, so that was nice. But use those. I don't want to say sparingly or at your leisure, but use them. Use them when you feel like you're uh, in a bad spot. I'll say um, you don't need to hog your MP. You you probably have a fair amount of. MP on your heroine by now, if you've been uh, building her accordingly. But also maybe uh, maybe try to keep some MP around just to Trost start out of areas, though as I said before, Trost start st starts to become a little less useful when they start to break up the dungeons like this, so you can't just go all the way back to the beginning then, you know, put your tail between your legs and go back to town. I really love the music here. This game just has phenomenal soundtrack. Sipping on a uh, cream soda that uh, is a local brand that uh, we picked up, and uh, it's a good time. I uh, you ever have like a local brand that it's like, damn, I wish the rest of the world could experience this. I feel that way so many different times. Oh yeah, this Maziolan. I was right, god damn it. Um, but yeah, I'm just uh, sipping on this cream soda and just like, damn, this doesn't exist anywhere like outside of my vicinity, and that's kind of unfortunate. As you can see, the Hydra doesn't like getting hit by lightning all that much. But yeah, these, yeah, as you can see, these things can really fuck with ya. But a few casts of magic is gonna mean that we're gonna be able to make quick work of it. Don't let this fight go on too long if you can help it. Uh, bring demons that have uh, powerful group magic attacks as well if you can, and just really go to town and try to do as much uh, multi-target attack damage in your turns as you can. Being poisoned also kind of sucks a little bit, too. Not ideal. You can see, though, that was a shit ton of experience points, thankfully. So, 
you may remember that we fused an Undyne. We're actually going to need our pal Undyne right here. As you uh, heard from the NPCs over in that last demon town that we traveled to, Undyne is going to be able to dive into the water here and retrieve the Flood Tide Orb, which we're not going to need right now, but we're going to need for the next section of the Demon World, so you might as well just bite the bullet and uh, when you're going through for your, st uh, for your first time, just uh, have her go in and do this. So you need Undyne summoned into your party too. I recommend you don't try to beat the Hydras with Undyne in your party. She'll probably eat shit right away. Uh, but beat, beat the Hydras, walk out, and then summon Undyne, then walk back in like I just did. And then you're going to be prompted to have her dive into the water, and this will happen. It's a real trial of faith here in your demon friend. So you actually, if you give up and leave, the game will actually let you leave, uh, and you'll lose out on Undyne forever. And you'll have to go back and fuse another Undyne and go back and do this whole sequence all up over again. I can't imagine having to do that. If I accidentally clicked yes here, I would have been so fucking annoyed. Um, you can't, uh, j just, just stick with it. You can't leave, uh, and get what you need here. So, just, uh, keep saying no. Just keep waiting for your friend, no matter how long it takes. And eventually she's gonna come back up with the Flood Tide Orb. That's pretty useful. It's like a giant super soaker. Well, super soakers don't create water. What the fuck am I talking about? You know what I mean. Let's try Aestel on out of here. Actually, uh, I don't know why I decided to do that specifically. It was probably just closer to wherever I was trying to go. I was probably looking at maps. I trust myself to believe I probably did that for a very good reason. Got another Morgan in the party, so we can tell that Morgan to fuck off. And there we go. Yeah, a lot of these cave systems have multiple exits that just let you go to different parts of this uh, little subsection of the Demon World, or the Valley of Despair. It can be quite confusing to get a, you know, keep track of, uh, or get a hold of, or however you want to say it. This is this is definitely the point of the game where if you haven't been using maps, uh, I would recommend maybe start if you're getting frustrated because oh boy, I can't imagine, you know, or if you're one of the people that like to, uh, you know, map things out. Uh, I'm sure it's a, I'm sure the suction gave you many headaches, but I can see that being a fun endeavor in its own right. I kind of miss manual mapping in uh, old games and stuff like that. Just a uh, just a little fun quirk of old game playing that uh, definitely been lost to the ages a bit. I appreciate that this section of the cave changes up the palette a little bit, even though it's basically the same tile set. The purple floor and the gray stone walls, just uh, kind of nice after so much green and blue and all that that we were seeing before. Change in music is also very ominous and appreciated. This is a good track. God, this game's music. I, I know I say this all the time, but fucking... Bangers. Whole soundtrack. Really a fantastic job on the soundtrack for this game. There's like a specific like catchiness, but also I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I'm also not a music person, so fuck me for even trying to really talk critically about this. But dungeon crawlers I feel like need to need to reach a certain weird point with their dungeon crawling tracks where it can't be too catchy or like too it can't go like too hard in that it's distracting um it, it needs to be like a certain level of like mellow and just something that's easily listen listenable to in the background while you do your stuff while also still you know being catchy enough and engaging that you never get sick of hearing it over after hours it's a very 
very difficult balance to to hit something like that. And I'd be I'd be very curious to um I don't know, maybe people watching this if you have any experience in this chime in, but when when you make music for games, I wonder how much of the play experience comes into the conversation like that. Like, oh, we want this theme to hit a certain mood or uh, serve a certain role because it's going to be utilized for these parts of the game and we don't want player. We definitely don't want players getting sick of this song or this this can't be a song that could get grating after a few minutes or, um, oh, we want this song to be catchy and poppy but it's only going to be used for a little bit here and there or stuff like that. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of discussions that go into decisions like that. Maybe not so much for these older games where the soundtracks were uh, kind of limited due to storage space restrictions, and uh, in many cases they had to reuse tracks for multiple, you know, each track often had to serve multiple different um, roles within the story. Or, you know, like games like this, you would have um, dungeons that have very, you know, basically the same uh, theme over and over again. And finding a balance to somehow vary that up enough could uh, could be tricky. I definitely uh, have a lot of respect for people who had to make these games and factor in all sorts of decisions like that. We are about to get to a pretty long boss fight, so be careful and uh, prepare yourself if you haven't already. It says Modai! And at some point in this Let's Play, I don't know if I did this with Bale or not, actually, but there was a point where I where I learned mid-recording this Let's Play, like, wait a minute, you can talk to the bosses and they give you, like, a little, a little thing. Which is cute. Usually it's not much, but, um, I was like, oh my god, that's such a cute little detail, because I, I believe in a lot of these... Actually, I don't know, I feel like I haven't tried it in a lot of Mega Ten games, because I just assumed it was nothing, but maybe I should try that in more games. Um, I was just kind of shocked when I saw that they actually had dialogue. Um, so it's just a cute little thing you can do to get a little bit more character out of these guys when you fight them. Uh-oh, our spell was reflected, so that wasn't great. The... Demonic bosses of each of these areas uh, have a good chunk of health, um, and these fights are, uh, I'm actually looking at it right now, we're, we're over the halfway point, this, this guy didn't last as long as I remember him lasting, but I definitely know later on, uh, as we get to other tyrant-type bosses, uh, that each have control over certain areas of the demon world, um, they get pretty spongy, uh, and the fights can get a little annoying, so uh, if you feel like you're about to hit a boss or, or, or you know you're about to hit a boss because you're looking at a map or whatever, just uh, make sure you heal up. Uh, definitely start to take the bosses a little more seriously as we get closer to the end game because they, they start to hit fairly hard, and uh, more than that, they just start to squeeze you dry of all your resources and MP and health and all that, so you gotta be kind of more careful and active. And you can see they're, they're doing... A bit more damage now. This guy, this guy's hitting multiple party members with each turn, and just, uh, just not a good time. But we beat him. That's a good chunk of experience too. That's a level up for sure. Hell yeah. Almost at 400 HP. Got an orb. Now each of these orbs are going to actually let us travel from the main shrine that we teleported to from Ground Zero, um, to a different section of the Demon World, which you'll see in a little bit. Oh hey. It's a dude. Oh, shit. Epic Persona 4 reference, am I right, Gamer? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this guy literally just... Your princess is in another... Or your goddess is in another castle. Ost. Um, which is funny. God, I really like this thing's design. I I kept trying to uh, bring it up earlier while recording this episode, 
Um, but I just never had the time to because I was always talking. I was always talking about something else. But I really like uh, Ladon's design here. Kanako does a very good job, I feel, of just sprinkling in a, a little Lovecraft um, every now and again. Um, just you know, not going too hard on it, or, or not trying to to do like you know cheesy Cthulhu, like going too hard on the Cthulhuism, but. Uh, just just a, a little bit of cosmic horror uh, touched into the designs uh, in a very tasteful manner that I appreciate a lot. Um, I don't think I've talked too much about Kanako the Sluts Play, which is kind of a shame because this was the first Megami Tensei game that he uh, provided illustrations and designed for. And, you know, he really helped establish the identity and character of the series and, and kind of how it looked. Um, and just what people come to uh, or came to expect from the aesthetics and all that over many decades and up until now even, you know, people really love Kaneko and his design work and all that, and it, me included. Uh, I really have a lot of respect for the man's depictions of various mythological and, you know, figures from legend and all that and how they're depicted in the series are, are very creative and innovative. But yeah, I am just about out of time, so we'll have to talk about Kaneko some other time, I suppose. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.